Welcome. Uh, so, yeah, um, I hope you are all here to contribute to CentOS Stream Kernel. Uh, and maybe not. Maybe you just like uh, get inspiration uh, or maybe get scared away by what we have and what we have built. Uh, anyway, uh, today I will explain how uh, people external to, to the uh, RHEL or Red Hat kernel teams can contribute to the CentOS stream and by means of uh, uh, RHEL taking the CentOS stream to the RHEL kernel. Uh, so first, I will spend a few words about what is the kernel package in CentOS stream. <coughs> it's a package as uh, any other, uh, and right, except it has some specifics. Uh, so it's, it's RPM, it's basically, it's actually a set of RPMs, uh, but the specifics are that uh, the source repository for the kernel, the, the, the Git repository where the work is done, is not the repository from which the RPM is built. This is different to most packages in, in CentOS stream. Uh, so it has separate uh, repository, more on that later. Uh, second difference is that uh, the work on the uh, Linux or the CentOS team kernel is parallel. So imagine like a bunch of, well, number of surgeons working, operating on the same body at the same time. One of them is like maybe updating the circular system, replacing arteries with something better while another one is replacing a leg at the same time. So there are some challenges, yeah, especially when the arteries go to the leg and they have to coordinate somehow. Uh, so yeah, just to, just to give you an idea how massive it is, I checked yesterday. Uh, so currently we have 149 uh, merge requests opened for CentOS Stream Kernel 9, yeah. Uh, some of those have uh, several hundreds of commits in, in, in them. Uh, of course, to have all of this uh, to be manageable, uh, the, the kernel teams have to establish some, uh, some processes around that because, yeah, it wouldn't work otherwise. Uh, so there are custom rules, custom processes that uh, needs to be adhered to if you want to contribute. On the other hand, the, the benefit of all of this is that uh, we basically need a dedicated person to maintain all of that, to merge the stuff, to take care of, the pack of uh, building the packages, pushing that to the, to the disk git, to the, to the uh, repository from which the packages are built. So we have a dedicated person or maybe even persons for that. Uh, and they deal with the CentOS stream processes themselves. Yeah? So the distribution have some processes, but the contributors to the kernel don't have to deal with those. So we basically exchange one set of processes, one set of complex processes for another set of complex processes. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the introduction. Uh, in order to understand what uh, what the work uh, entails, what are we basically constrained by. Let's first talk about the expectations. So let's take a user, user of CentOS stream, user of RHEL. Yeah, what they expect from the kernel? Of course, stability. What does that mean? That means no regressions. Stuff that worked before should work after a kernel update, right? Well, it's more, it's performance. Uh, no performance regressions. The user probably wants uh, after update for, this, for his workload, for their workloads to work as fast as they did before. Yeah, so performance regressions, no, no. Uh, no API changes, of course. If you have a program if, and then update the kernel, you still expect your application, your program to work. Yeah? And basically, every application interacts with the kernel. So the APIs that the kernel provides to applications should not change at all, yeah, right? This is what you expect. 
Well, then we have kernel modules. You may be using third-party kernel modules, like NVIDIA driver, for example, yeah, for your graphic card or whatever. And you want those drivers to work after the update, right? So to the kernel update. Yeah, so the problem is that those modules, those kernel modules, the kernel drivers, they are using the internal API of the kernel. So you want this application binary interface yeah, between the modules and the kernel to not change at all, right? Well, it turns out that some people want more, not just the binary interface. They want the, also the, the internal API, which means I take the driver source code from the old version, update the kernel, and compile it against the new kernel, and it should still compile. Yeah? Sounds, sounds like the same, but it's, like, it's actually a very different thing. No behavioral changes, of course. I want the stuff to run exactly as it was running before the update. So, yeah, in short, do not touch the stuff I'm using. <laughs> yeah? Red Hat, please keep your hands off the stuff, my stuff. And also, please bring me new features. Yeah, we want the newest Chinese. Yeah, so please, like, yeah, give us what we need. There's that new hardware we bought. We want it to work in your next release. So please update the drivers for us. Oh, and we also heard about this cool new feature that Upstream Kernel has. So please bring it too. Yeah, update the core. Update, like, yeah, 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 do. Please update it. Please update everything you can, except for the stuff I'm using. Don't touch that stuff. Yeah, now do you see the problem? Uh, that my stuff is different thing for different users. So everyone wants us to update everything except for this stuff. So this is the situation we're in. We need a compromise. Of course, we cannot deliver all of that uh, at once. So the compromise that we arrived to it's a compromise. Nobody is happy about it. But apparently, people are still buying RHEL and using CentOS Stream, so it's not that bad. So the compromise is no functional regressions. If something worked before, it should work after the update. Uh, performance, yeah, it's nah, we should not regress performance. But imagine cases when you do something and you improve performance for 90% of users by a lot didn't touch the performance for 9% of users, and for 1% of users, you slightly slowed down their, their workloads. Is that okay? Is it not? Who knows? Yeah, so there's some kind of balance. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, but probably slowing down networking for 90% of people or slowing down disk uh, storage reads, that's probably not acceptable. Uh, then, yeah, of course, uh, the, the user space API that the kernel provides to application that should not, not change, but it should not break. Yeah, so we can change it if we maintain backwards compatibility, probably. Or if nobody notices, that's OK as well, right? Uh, the kernel modules, yeah, they should probably work. But here is a problem. Uh, the, the, the kernel development upstream, yeah, the, the community kernel development, it doesn't, doesn't care about internal API stability. It changes all the time. The interfaces inside kernel and to the drivers, they are constantly changing. So if we are to bring in some new features, we cannot keep this interface uh, completely stable. Yeah. We can try to maintain some backwards compatibility, but it's like a lot of work and nobody's enjoying that work. It costs a lot. So yeah, so we have to limit somewhere. Again, it's, it's about finding a balance. Uh, we also sh are updating uh, drivers. Not all drivers, obviously. We don't have infinite people working on, uh, on the kernel. Uh, but we are updating drivers. But again, sometimes updating a driver means bringing in a new kernel core feature that the driver is using. Yeah, so there are dependencies. Uh, and it's not always easy, because sometimes bringing in some new feature from a stream, it's, it's, it's risky. 
Yeah, we risk stability, we risk introducing regressions. So again, it's kind of a balancing act. So we might update drivers, but maybe not enable all the features that the hardware support, supports. And of course, we updating the, the kernel core features. Again, balancing that with stability. Not everything is possible without compromising the other stuff. So yeah, as I said, nobody is happy, but hopefully it's good enough for everyone. Um, <coughs> how does this work in practice? When we started, and now I'll be talking mostly about, or basically only about uh, CentOS Stream 9, uh, but it applies to also the other, other streams. So for CentOS Stream 9, we, we had, when, when the development started, there was a kernel, was 5.14, and the CentOS Stream 9 is still on this kernel, yeah, even those years later. So we have kernel 5.14. But we are backporting stuff for upstream. We are taking uh, commits from upstream and applying them to the, to, to the kernel. Uh, and that ranges from single bug fixes for like, simple stuff, single features, to like large rebases of whole, all drivers and whole subsystems. So for example, for you to know what I'm talking about, the XFS file system is up to the upstream kernel 6.0. The USB uh, subsystem, all drivers, the core, like everything, is, uh, up, uh, is on par with upstream 6.2. You know, the latest kernel release upstream is 6.3, so this is pretty new. BPF subsystem, yeah? This is pretty core stuff that's like connected to really memory management and all of that. It's 6.2 in the kernel, in the current uh, CentOS Stream 9. Wireless, including all drivers, 6.3. Multipath TCP, 6.4. That kernel is not even yet released upstream. Yeah? So you see, all the different stuff is kind of sued into the kernel, yeah, replaced different version, and yeah. So maybe you get the Franco kernel, uh, terminology now, or technical term now. This is what we have. It works. It works, but, oh, one thing. One thing I forgot, and I will stress it multiple times. We are taking stuff from upstream. That means everything, almost everything, we strive for everything that we have in CentOS stream to be upstream. We're taking stuff from upstream. Everything is to be upstream first. So, as I said, all of this uh, can uh, stick together and work reasonably only thanks to, thanks to uh, several things. First is the processes we have around that I will talk about in a minute. And the second and very important thing is testing. So this is the testing uh, that happens whenever a single change, be it a single bug fix or that large rebase, whenever it is uh, applied to CentOS Stream Kernel. First testing <coughs> happens when a developer does uh, the work. So when we backport stuff from upstream, yeah, or when we develop stuff upstream and then backport it. So this is where the first testing happens. Yeah, obviously nobody wants to just push over the fence untested stuff. Then, automatic testing kicks in. Yeah, we have uh, CKI, uh, there were talks about CKI in previous DevComs. If you are interested, you can find the recordings online. So this is uh, uh, continuous kernel integration testing, large test suite uh, with a lot of infrastructure around that. So this is, this is Jan. We have LNST, uh, Linux network stack uh, testing, uh, which is specifically for testing networking perform, both functional performance. And we're adding more over time. So this is run automatically. Then there's pre-verification, which means before the change can be merged to the kernel, a human, and 
uh, hopefully, or, or maybe automation, if it's there, if there is automation for the particle feature or particle bug. But someone, someone else than the original author, and yeah, that's it's important, tests this. And if it passes, only then this is merged to the CentOS string kernel. Then there's integration testing, because it's nice that you tested one feature or one bug fix in isolation, but it can interact with those other 150 uh, parallel changes to the kernel in weird ways. So once this is merged, we need to test again to see whether it did not conflict or did not like, got influenced by other stuff in a negative way. And last thing is proper QA testing done by QE engineering that's like really comprehensive testing of the whole kernel and all the features and everything. So that's a lot of testing. Okay, so with that, Kurt, let's, uh, <coughs> let's uh, look how it looks from the point of view of the contributor to CentOS Gen kernel. The centerpiece is the merge request. We're using GitLab for CentOS stream, not just CentOS stream kernel, but the whole CentOS stream development. Uh, so this is the URL of uh, the uh, CentOS stream 9 kernel source repository. So this is where the development happens. It's completely public. You can go there. You can watch what we are working on and, of course, contribute. So match request against this repository. That's that's basically the, 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 the centerpiece uh, which, around which everything is built. However, before you can uh, f open a merge request, you need to do one important thing, and that is to file a bug or issue. Uh, every change we do needs to be tracked. So you go to Bugzilla or Jira, doesn't really matter, uh, file a bug or open an issue there. Be sure to select the proper product component, subcomponent, uh, product Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, component, obviously, kernel, subcomponent in Bugzilla, whatever you think is the best fit. The reason for that is you want your change, your merge request to reach the, the proper team. And in the bug or in the issue, explain why you are doing that. Explain the benefits of it. Why it's important. If you, if you come as a contributor to CentOS Stream Kernel, it's not uh, the, the amount of work uh, that is connected to the, con the contribution, it doesn't end with submitting patches, submitting commits. There's more. There's testing I talked about. Someone has to do it. And there's maintenance. Someone ha needs to maintain that stuff for the, all, the whole period where RHEL, that Enterprise Linux, is maintained, which is many years. Yeah, so submissions don't come for free for Red Hat. So explain benefits. Explain why. Uh, the change is good. And also, because it means work for other people, try to make it easier for them. Provide detailed testing steps. Yeah, so the, so the Q, Q, Q quality engineering uh, is okay with the change because they know, okay, this won't be that much work for us. Uh, don't forget to, to note that you will be submitting the merge request. So you are not asking the developer to do the work. Yeah? Make it easier for them. And be mentally prepared for the option that it might be rejected. <coughs> so we have a bug or issue. Then now let's do the work. Uh, we clone the repository as usual from GitLab. Yeah, starting create our own branch based on the main branch. This is where the like the main branch is where the where the uh, 
development happens, apply our patches. Now, let's stop at that. Uh, the, and now this is the first, <laughs> the first thing about the processes. The, the commits, the commit messages, they have some mandatory format. I will explain it in next, uh, on next slide. Yeah, so it's not like free form uh, commit message. So that's first thing. Second thing, apply upstream commits one to one. Yeah, so one upstream commit is one uh, CentOS stream commit. Do not squash commits together. And of course, it's a Franken kernel, you know, so it's unlikely that commit from upstream will apply as is to CentOS stream kernel. Most likely, oh, well, some commits do if you're lucky, but most likely you will have to do some changes, adjust to the old APIs that are there or, or something. Those changes need to be explained. Yeah? There should be like, reasons why, your, why the, 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 the backport differs from the upstream. Let's look at the example. This is a real commit from CentOS Stream 9. Uh, and uh, let's see. First, the mandatory fields, mandatory format. There must be a Bugzilla or Jira link in every commit. Every single commit must have this line. Uh, and in this format, yeah, it's, it's parsed by machines. So even like training white space is a problem. Yeah, uh, you will be taught, so it's not like, uh, it's not entirely black box, more on that later. So this is the first thing. Second thing, every, as I said, uh, the, the policy, there is upstream first policy. So everything that we bring to a CentOS stream kernel must be upstream. This line actually says this is the hash of the upstream commit, this one is backporting. Yeah, so, and again, exactly this format. It is parsed by machines. Third thing that's mandatory is the signed off byline, which has some legal implication. Uh, if you're not familiar with the certificate of, certificate of origin, yeah, see the documentation. Uh, must be there. And here, I will point out this section. This is not passed by machine. This is for human consumption, for reviewers. Yeah, so this is free form, except the conflicts line that like, must be in this form, uh, explains what was changed compared to upstream. Yeah, so this is, this is an example how it looks like. <coughs> so you apply patches, and then you can su finally submi submit a merge request. Yeah, the usual GitLab workflow, nothing you are not familiar with, so basically you fork, uh, add remote, push to your remote, open a merge request using uh, web UI or API and you're done. Almost. In the match request description, you have to repeat two things, the bugzilla or gila link and your sign of by line. When you do it, then the automation kicks in on GitLab. A kernel is built and it's tested. If you are an external contributor, uh, then, then only uh, limited, limited tests are run. Uh, it's not, not full test. It's for security reasons. Once your submission received reviewed by someone from Red Hat, uh, they will start the, the, the complete pipeline. Uh, we don't want uh, the, yeah, the, the, the code compromised by a External, comp uh, external contributions, obviously. Uh, then also some, uh, some automation uh, is, uh, is run, uh, which uh, will do checks on the submission. It will check whether the fields I described, like all that bugzilla entry and so on, whether it's present. If not, it will, it will tell you in a comment in the merge request. Uh, 
It will check whether the bugzilla or Jira issue you filed, whether it's in proper state. There's something you cannot influence. Someone at the head has to put that in the, in the correct state, the bug or issue. Uh, another check is for missing fixes. So if you backported something from upstream and there was a follow-up upstream that fixed that, you will get, and it's not there, it's not in your submission, you will get notified. Uh, it will also check for conflicts between submitted merge requests. It is quite important given the amount of merge requests we have. Then, there will be some labels added. Actually, quite a lot of labels. So this is an example of one merge request. Uh, there are uh, subsystem labels here. Basically, those indicate which uh, subsystem were touched or were modified by your submission. This is a large merge request. Yeah? Uh, it has, I don't know, like three or 400 commits. Yeah, so it touches a lot of subsystems. Uh, there are labels with the current state, like XNet needs review or CKI and so on. Uh, it will also add approval rules uh, to, uh, to, to GitLab to the merge request, meaning will list people who should review the merge request, and it will notify them. Then a review, then a review happens. This is important part, but there's nothing surprising. So someone from Red Hat or from community uh, will review the commits you submitted, will make comments. Now it's important to, to respond to the comment. If someone has objections or ask for, ask for explanation, provide that. The discussion happens in the, in the merge request, yeah, uh, in, the, in the comments there, and when Finally, when it's reviewed, everything is ready. The merge request is ready for QE testing. That means you get all of these labels uh, in the OK or warning state uh, at worst. So your commit description is OK, no merge conflicts, uh, this, the, the CI testing succeeded, and uh, somebody or like all the approvals were given, the, all the needed reviews were done. Then, and Bugzilla and Jira is like in uh, prepared for testing state, you get ready for QA, then the testing happens, the pre-verification, again, done by someone else than you. Uh, you will probably agree in the Bugzilla or Jira who will do the testing, whether it will be Red Hat or whether someone from your company or your, friend provides, or your friends provides the testing, whatever. Then, if that then it's done, then you get Bugzilla or Jira OK, ready for merge, and boom, it's merged. Or the maintainer will merge it. Uh, one short uh, notice. Uh, sometimes, if uh, the, for example, if there is a driver update, it might depend on other uh, changes in the kernel. Yeah, so if you, for example, update the, the, uh, the, the networking driver, yeah, your favorite networking driver, uh, to the newest version, it might need some changes in networking core to support new protocol, perhaps, or something. So that's a different merge request, of course. It's not the same stuff. So different merge request needs to be filed for that. And to save us time, you can actually submit those merge requests uh, in parallel you can depend on other merge requests which is not yet merged by pulling the code, applying your patches on top, and submitting that. The only thing you have to do is put this line to the, to the merge request description that you are depending on this particle and other merge request. And then uh, the, the automation we have will be able to figure it out, uh, find out that like what is the first commit that is really part of your merge request, so that's like top of the dependencies. We'll put this label there, and then you're good. The only problem is GitLab is not aware of that. Yeah, this is a feature that is missing in GitLab, uh, so we, we implemented it ourselves. And as a consequence, it's really hard to impossible to, to use the web UI. I will, yeah, okay, 15 seconds. We have tools that will help you with it. Lab, 
is a CLI tool that helps with submitting merge requests. And we have Reviewmatic, which is a custom tool that helps with reviews, that understands the workflow we have. So that's it. Here's a link for full documentation of the process if you're interested in details. And now questions. Yeah, uh, so the question was uh, that by doing the backports, we are repeating the work that upstream does with the, with the LTS kernels, uh, and better it would not be easier to, to, to use them. Uh, yeah, uh, the problem is that, the, uh, that the, the quality of the upstream stable kernels is not satisfactory or at least this we found. Uh, there are things like uh, machine learning involved which selects which commits are backported. Uh, and also basically whatever someone thinks uh, is desirable for those stable kernels thrown over the wall and applied. And it does not mean, this does not meet the stability and no regression guarantee, guarantees we need. So we really want all the stuff that's going into that to get reviewed by us, yeah, and to be tracked, to to have uh, someone who's responsible. That's like we can go back to say, okay, yeah, look, you broke it, you fix it. Yeah, uh, so all of it together, uh, we found out it's like for, for stability. It's it's yeah, it, it's basically no go. Yeah, there's a question. Um, for the integration test, what specifically did you want to do? I mean, it's in the upstream kernel test too, but is there more? Yeah, so the question was what, uh, what, uh, is, uh, what the con integration testing consists of, what, 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 what it is. Uh, basically, right now, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's done by CKI again, but it's uh, like a larger battery of tests. There's a lot of different test suites there. I don't remember off the top of my head, but they are. There's LTP and like many more. Are they open source as well? Uh, the question was whether they are open source. I, I believe so. I, I, I'm not 100% sure of everything, but I, I think so. Uh, please don't like, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you.